Today's chess game is a training game between Mikhail Tal and Alexander Koblinsk. Koblinsk was a longtime trainer and good friend of Tal, and many of Tal's successes can be attributed in part to Koblinsk's work. In this game, perhaps because of the training casual nature of the game, we see Tal at his absolutely most unbridled, and we see spirited defense from Koblinsk. The game is one of the most complicated Tal games of all time. E4 opens the game and c5 is played in response. Knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3, and knight c6 introduces the Richter Rosser game, one of the many sharp Sicilian variations that black can choose from. Now, bishop g5, pawn e6, queen d2, bishop e7, and castles queenside and castles kingside sets the tone for the game. If you've not seen Sicilian games like this, both sides are setting up to try to absolutely maul the opposing player. When you castle on opposite sides, especially in a Sicilian, you're indicating that a pawn storm is likely as you try to go for the opposing king. Both players will try to do this in most games. Now, normally you can't launch your pawns at the opposing king because your king is sitting behind the pawns that you might launch, but when you castle on opposite sides, that's no longer a restriction and the game, become, the game becomes a free-for-all for the pawns as they race toward the opposing king. We see that very, very quickly after knight b3, queen b6. This is all theory, although I don't really understand queen b6. It seems odd to place the queen in front of the pawn. Pawn f3 and pawn g4. f3 prepared g4 and is kind of an English attack uh, setup from white, except that the bishop on g5 is in front of the pawn. Normally in the English attack, the bishop is on e3. But this setup here, uh, where the pawns race forward in this formation, is typical of some of the most aggressive English attack lines that you can choose. So we get rook to d8, bishop back to e3, getting out of the way of the g pawn so it can march up the board. Queen c7, pawn h4, pawn b5. Now we finally see black getting the pawns into the action as well, and pawn g5. Now, a good question here, I think, is why not play knight h5 in this position? You would like to try to blockade the h-pawn so it can advance up the board. The problem is that white can get the knight out of the way with queen f2, which threatens bishop to b6, a nice little tempo move. After rook b8 or some other move to respond to that threat, pawn f4 is a good move. And now bishop e2 comes, and the knight is really stuck over here. White's going to play bishop e2. The knight's going to be in trouble, and white's going to end up opening lines on the king side even more quickly because of the knight's exposed position. So the knight retreats to d7 instead, knight d7. Pawn g6. H takes g6. And then h5. This is very common in these Sicilians, throwing the pawn up the board with g6 and then following up with an advance of the h pawn is a way to sacrifice a pawn, but open lines to the opposing king. When you're in an opposite side's castling position, all you want to do is open up the opposing king as fast as possible, and you really don't mind sacrificing a pawn to do that. It's not a concern at all. So after h5, Koblenz goes ahead and takes that pawn, which makes sense. Of course, he's very concerned about the attack on the h-file, but he does have some resource. So we get knight f6, kicking the rook back, and the rook falls all the way back to h1. It actually probably made sense to pull it back a little less far, which gives more room for the other pieces to quickly access the h-file and double or even triple. But the rook does fall back to h1, and we get pawn to d5 from black, trying to break in the center a little bit, trying to get some play. Now, at this point, Tal does seem to have a forced win that he missed in the game. The game is so complicated that there are actually many forced wins and good defenses um, that the computer points out that the players did not see. Possibly also because it was a training game, I wonder if they weren't playing with, you know, normal classical time controls, and they may not have had enough time to really dive deeply into the position. So the game is inaccurate, 
partially because I think of the nature of the game and partially just because the game is so complicated that no one could play it accurately. In any case, the forced win here is a very nice move, bishop to f4. The idea is just to push e5. If you push e5 and kick the knight off of f6, then invading on the h-file is absolutely devastating and basically just wins on the spot. After bishop d6, trying to make sure that you stop e5, you can just trade here and then play pawn f4. And now there's no way to stop e5 really and queen h2 and white's attack succeeds on the spot. So that was one way, a very nice way to finish off the game right here. In the game, after d5, Tau played e5 right away, offering a pawn sacrifice to get his attack going. I think the point of e5 is really to get his queen to h2 by sacrificing the pawn um, to, uh, to block the black queen's defense of h2. So knight takes e5, and now bishop to f4, pinning the knight and looking at queen h2 with a threat of mate and a threat to win the knight. It actually looks like queen h2 immediately might have been better, but of course this is quite threatening. Now bishop to d6, now the queen comes over to h2, and the king tries to get out of dodge. So if the king could get out of the middle of the board, the sacrifices from white he's offered at this point two pawns, and they're very important pawns. The sacrifices from white would really be too much if the king could get safely to e7. Of course, Tal is trying desperately to stop that. He plays queen h8, and this was the moment that the king could have gone to e7. And this is also a good example of why it was a mistake um, to play bishop f4 uh, before queen h2. The loss of tempo really does matter. You can look at the variations to see more details there. The king could have stepped here right away, and possibly what black missed was that after queen takes g7, which looks to pick up a very important pawn and seem to create some big threats, rook g8, queen h6, there's a very nice tactic right here that wins on the spot for black. The key is knight d3 check, and whatever white does to recapture, we're going to get bishop takes f4. And in this case, it's going to fork the queen and the king, just ending the game right away. So because of that, king e7 was an excellent move that would have totally turned the game around. The queen has to fall backwards, and the king sits pleasantly on e7. White's attack is really at an end, and he'll need a lot of luck and some errors from his opponent to turn it around after this. So instead, black plays knight to g8 choosing to block right away and choosing to keep the king on f8 defending g7. Of course, g7 is now a target and it is the target until the end of the game. So we're really gonna focus our attention here. Tal immediately goes after it with rook h7, which of course is tremendously threatening right here. And pawn f5, trying to defend the g pawn on the seventh rank. This is a very important defensive idea um, when you're facing an attack like this, defending on the seventh rank with moves like this is often a critical defense and you have to watch for opportunities to hold sensitive squares like g7 in this fashion. Tau continues with bishop h6 and because of the double pin on the knight on g8 um, and the pawn on g7, the bishop cannot be captured on h6, so a nice strong move that immediately threatens to just take d7 or take g7. Rook d7 stepping up to defend along the seventh rank. And this is a good point to pause the video and try to figure out what Tao played. He did find the best move and a very nice move. So Tao plays bishop takes b5 right here. The idea is of course just to sacrifice the bishop to get it out of the way of the rook so that the rook can immediately enter the action and help pressure the g pawn. Also when black captures We'll always have this move, which is going to be very critical as well. So instead, black had a good move here after bishop takes b5. Knight g6 traps the white queen in the corner of the board here on h8. Now <laughs> you have to play knight d4 here, which is really spectacular, ignoring the fact that your queen is trapped to go after e6. Really great stuff. Now a forced or relatively forced continuation seems to be knight takes uh, here and then you get the fork 
and you capture over here um, after the king moves out of the way. Now, rook takes, walks into rook takes again, and then the king has to walk into a discovered check here, but after the discovered check winning a rook, black is able to take over here on h6. Then the rook can step back and fork the knights, and the knight can step off of h8 and defend the other knight, and then the attacked bishop on b5 can retreat, or, well, advance, actually, and hit this and this. Stockfish actually says that this is equal. Of course, it's a spectacular line, and it's hard to find almost any part of the line, but it's very interesting and was quite a nice opportunity from Black to try to pull the knight back and go after the queen right here, trapping it. Great opportunity. So instead, after bishop takes b5, black tries rook to f7, choosing not to take the bishop and moving the attacked rook. After the rook moves, we of course get rook g1, introducing more pressure into that critical focal point here on g7. And rook up, adding more defense to g7. I attack g7, you defend g7. A nice move here was bishop to e8. This was a winning move, although it's not really forced, it just increases the bind. The point, of course, is that you can't take without dropping this, which is going to be a big problem, which means that the rook should move, and then the bishop can perform this really nice maneuver where it switches over from b5 over to the much more useful square here on h5. Still, even though this is a really nice maneuver that keeps a winning pressure from white, it's also not uh, immediately decisive in that there's no force continuation in the next two or three moves that just totally finishes black off. In the game, Tau played knight to d4 instead. After knight d4, black found a brilliant move, knight to g4, trying to close down the g file, taking the pressure off of g7, and this is the best move in the position, and gaining time for some counterplay, because at this point, white has a lot of pieces that are potentially hanging. So after the knight is captured, which is necessary, there was an important opportunity here. Black could have played bishop to f4 with check. Now, if the bishop is captured, when the queen recaptures, there's a hit here on the king and this knight here on d4, so black is profiting in that way. So it makes more sense to actually move the king out of the way. And then after bishop takes, there's g5, which traps the bishop here on h6, which is pretty great. But the variation's not over. After bishop takes, rook takes, queen uh, into f4 forks the rook on g5 and the knight on d4. Good stuff there. And now the rook moves over to h5, which has a threat of queen takes g8, king takes, and rook h8 checkmate which is of course more great stuff. You can't capture here on d4 because of that threat. So you have to move the rook so that there's room for the king to get away to f7 if you take here on g8 and try to mate with rook h8 check. Um, and then rook h4 steps back and defends the loose knight. Um, and at the end of all of this, white has an advantage, but things remain really, really complicated. Great stuff. Just thrilling variations, absolutely. Um, I encourage you to look at the notes and just play through them because it's really, really wonderful stuff here. Bishop e5 was played instead of bishop f4 check. After bishop e5, um, the best move seems to be knight f3 when bishop takes c3 runs into knight h4, which is crushing because of the threat of knight to g6 checkmate. Really, really beautiful, just ignoring the hanging bishop on c3. I love this maneuver. Knight f3, h4, and then into g6. In the game, Tau played knight c6, which looks pretty great as well because you're hitting a7 and e5. But this gives more counterplay to black if black takes on b5 here. So if black takes on b5, then you have knight takes, queen takes here. Um, and white is winning, but white needs to play, I think here, g takes f5, and it's still really complicated. It's still really complicated. Maybe rook f1 is even better than g takes f5. You'd need a lot of time to analyze this. Black doesn't capture here on b5, though, and instead black takes on c3 in this position, trying to eliminate the knight. 
and break up the king position so there could potentially be some counterplay down here. Now, winning was just taking back, but Tal picks a more imaginative move, as you might expect. He plays his bishop back to e3, which attacks this, but even more importantly, I think it threatens bishop to c5, a huge threat here. So black responds with d4, um, shutting down this bishop so it can't either take the rook or get to c5, and of course the bishop is threatened. And now a great move from Tal, the only winning move in the position, rook g h1. Again, the threat is simply to take here on g8 and then mate with rook to h8 checkmate. Fantastic stuff. So after rook to d7, we get bishop to g5, taking on f5 was better, I'll just leave it there. And now black does go ahead and capture on b5, and at this point, Tal invades with rook 1 to h6. The big threat here is to go rook f6 check, and then after black takes, to play bishop h6 check, which we're going to see in the game. Now, Koblenz did have a way out in this position. His way out is queen takes on c6. And then if rook f6 check, pawn takes bishop h6 check, and then rook g7, bishop takes g7, the king can run away and get and black gets a draw here and there's actually a few ways you can draw but by giving up the bishop on b2 you have enough counterplay the problem is that in the game koblenz actually tried pawn to d3 which is a little bit too imaginative he really needed to go ahead and take the knight on c6 at this point tal goes ahead and captures on c3 and Koblenz does not have the same counterplay anymore against the white king that we saw just a moment ago giving uh, enough counterplay to draw. The white king is actually safe, and so now the threat of rook f6 check and bishop h6 is just a winning threat. So we get d2 check and king d1, and Koblenz takes on c6 just a couple of moves too late to escape Tal's magnificent attack. Finally, we do get rook f6 check, pawn takes, oh, actually he played rook f7, but g takes is the main line, bishop check, and then after the block you take here, the king has to try and run off the back rank so he's not pinned down by the queen and the rook. You can pick this up with check here, it's double check, <laughs> the bishop and the rook are giving check, the king steps up, bishop check, and you finally pick up the rook over here on a7 and this is a winning advantage in a large part because the knight is trapped here on g8 and the black king is also very exposed and there are a lot of problems as a result so in the game we saw rook f7 actually but then this is simply refuted by queen takes g7 because the rook is pinned so after the king moves we're simply going to take here on f7 and I'll just put that on the board because the domination that white achieves through the breakthrough on g7 with both rooks and the queen on the seventh rank is really spectacular. Of course, it is mate in just a couple of moves in this position. This is a brilliant game. It is also a flawed game. There are many missed opportunities for both players but that in no way reduces the brilliance in my opinion. I hope that you enjoyed the game, both the main lines and some of the variations for both Tal and Koblenz. If you like this video, please do like and subscribe to be notified of future videos and also check out the playlist with more incredible games from Mikhail Tal.